You're listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, Holland and Knight's overarching public policy and regulation podcast series. Our public policy and regulation group has an ideal combination of lawyers and lobbyists with a comprehensive understanding of the federal policy and regulatory process. This series will shine a light on the shifting dynamics of governmental entities and the ensuing changes in economic or political policies, laws, and regulations that can have a critical impact on the health and future of your business. I'm truly honored to have the pleasure of speaking today with you as Congressman Ted Deutsch. Congressman Deutsch represents Florida 22nd District, serving his seventh term in Congress. He is the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism. He is chair of the House Ethics Committee and a senior member on the House Judiciary Committee. For decades, Congressman Deutsch has been a steadfast, passionate advocate for a strong U.S.-Israel relationship and stood for Israel's right to defend itself in a hostile region. Congressman Deutsch, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Uh, thanks, Maytal. Really wonderful to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity. So let's go back uh, before, prior to the recent escalation, uh, the passage of the Middle East Partnership for Peace Act, as well as the Abraham Accords, held a lot of promise for investment in high tech and infrastructure development for both Israelis and Palestinians. Where do you see this going now? Uh, well, these are these are both really significant initiatives, and uh, and the the recent conflict I think really highlighted the the need for programs like this that recognize that we have to look for ways to both improve the quality of life for Israelis and Palestinians because that benefits Israel security as well uh, and. Uh, for finding ways for Israel to engage more fully with uh, with its its um, Arab neighbors, those in the Sunni Arab world, and so the the step that we've taken, these two steps are, are really significant. The partnership for Peace Act, the Nita Lowy partnership for Peace Act. I have to I have to add uh, something that uh, my dear former colleague Ron's former colleague Nita Lowy. Uh, champion for such a long time now has her name on it as it should uh, is 250 million dollar program over five years and it goes to to two funds the people to people partnership for peace fund and the joint investment for peace initiative and uh, and what it does is it, it gives us the opportunity to make tangible and create tangible and lasting connections between Israelis and Palestinians and create infrastructure in the West Bank that will provide opportunities for uh, for the Palestinians, it'll bring Israelis and Palestinians together. When I mean, for all all the times I've traveled and have met with Israelis and Palestinians, everybody wants their lives to be better. They just want to have good lives. They want to break down tension. They they want opportunities to succeed for themselves and and for their families. And these initiatives, this economic investment, will will help to create those ties. It's it's really really significant. And I'm. Um, uh, I'm working hard to make sure that it's implemented fully for the benefit of uh, of peace and to help bring Israelis and Palestinians together. Um, the as far as the Abraham Accords, it's it's pretty remarkable. I think we would all agree when you you stop and and think about the fact that Israel is now normalizing relations with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Morocco. And I mean, of course, Morocco has a long history, a strong Jewish community, and um, but Morocco and, and a growing number of countries. And that provides really significant opportunities, um, first from an economic standpoint, and I think we need to to build upon that and encourage that that kind of of uh, not just government to government, but private sector to private sector interaction. Uh, I think that's really significant. But we also have to recognize there's the chance, and we're seeing it. And as we come through the pandemic and tourism increases, we'll see more of it of real people to people interaction. Uh, people from Dubai really anxious to go to Tel Aviv, Israelis really anxious to go to Dubai uh, and Abu Dhabi. And that just 
as one example, um, Morocco, I, I had, I spent some time with a Moroccan ambassador the other day, and she talked about the, the influx of people that they're expecting. I, I think all of this uh, is really setting the stage for dramatic growth in the relations between Israel and other countries in the region. And most importantly, these these uh, opportunities to bring people together socially, uh, economically, and in ways that will only provide greater opportunity for all. Absolutely. And um, I can tell you personally, I know so many Israelis, family and friends, <laughs> that have been already traveling there. And, and um, it's very exciting and very hopeful. And, and we have to keep being hopeful. So uh, Congress has always unwaverly supported the bilateral commercial and defense relationship with Israel and combated BDS. In light of those recent voices we've heard, um, do you see a viable threat to this support or within the Democratic Party? Um, look, the, the, answer, the answer is that the support for Israel and the U.S. Israel relationship is deep and it is bipartisan and it will continue to be that way. Yes, there are some voices uh, on the margins who who have made arguments that are um, that range from problematic to outrageous, quite frankly. Um, and I'm I'm not going to I am not going to dignify the arguments by recounting them. Uh, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of uh, Democrats and Republicans in Congress recognize the importance of supporting this relationship. That's why we passed a resolution condemning BDS um, overwhelmingly with over 400 votes. It's why just recently I led uh, an effort with majorities of both Democrats and Republicans reaffirming our commitment to U.S. security assistance without any conditions. Uh, that's why uh, the legislation that I passed to expand all of the ways that the U.S. and Israel can work together passed unanimously in the House. So, uh, yes, there are voices that we need to uh, we need to confront and call out and and point out uh, where they are wrong. Um, but we also need to continue to lift up uh, the voices. So many strong young voices, new members of Congress, just over the past two terms, um, from from. Richie Torres, who's a new member now, Elaine Luria, who is now in her second term, uh, just two right off the top. Kathy Manning is a new member now. I mean, these are strong pro-Israel Democrats who really represent, I think, the future of, of the relationship. Uh, and they need to be given the opportunity to, to speak out and to be heard. Um, I know it's it's tempting. I'll just finish with this. I know it, it's tempting to to often listen to the the loudest voices and the the most extreme voices. Certainly, that's something that we got used to uh, during the last administration. Uh, but it doesn't serve us well when we uh, when we focus entirely on voices, especially when they aren't representative of the whole. And the whole continues to be strongly supportive of Israel. Absolutely, and, and thank you so much for for saying that and mentioning those members and. Um, and, and those legislations that you've led, um, and you really truly authorized a number of, of pieces of legislations that have opened up the bilateral commercial relationship. As co-chairs of the Israel practice at Holland and I, both former Congressman Ron Klein and myself, we work closely with amazingly innovative Israeli companies. Israeli companies that are eager to collaborate with U.S. companies, expand operations in the U.S., and create innovative jobs here. And there is such a wealth of innovation in Israel in so many areas that are of interest here in the U.S. And just to name a few, cybersecurity, 3D printing, climate technologies, renewable energy, water technologies, agriculture technologies, and food tech. And I know you're a vegan and Israeli plant-based food tech. <clears throat> is truly an exciting space with innovative plant-based meat and other animal-based food alternative. So where do you see the bilateral commercial relationship going and, and what does it mean for business? Uh, well, what you've described is, is exactly what we've been trying to help lift up 
um, in Congress. The the opportunities that exist between the United States and Israel, uh, because of the kind of innovative companies that you just described, are really significant. So I I've authored a couple pieces of legislation over the past few years that uh, that that really look at all of the ways that we can grow the U.S. Israel relationship. So we established a U.S. Israel Energy Center. We established cooperation on water issues that uh, that can no doubt have an impact in the region more broadly and uh, and uh, the, the focus on climate that you talked about and the, the technology that's being done, uh, that, that's being implemented there. We, we passed legislation to expand cooperation on health tech, which is a, a huge issue that um, the Israelis are really out in front on, um, especially as, as it's focused on, um, on COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, and um, and we also, in, in this, this is not the, the private sector, but uh, we also thought it was important for all the times that we've heard about how Israel Aid is the first, the Israeli humanitarian organization is always the first on the ground, often, usually, the first on the ground wherever there's a disaster around the world. Um, why not find ways for, for Israeli and American humanitarian groups to work together. So, so we've done that. Um, businesses have, have so many opportunities to, uh, to really support emerging fields, like the ones that you've talked about. And some of the partnerships for Americans and Israelis have existed for decades. The, the bird program, BARD program, I know you're familiar with. Uh, so it's, it's a natural evolution for us to now include the private sector. It's it's why we see so many U.S. companies establishing offices in Israel. And if you're an American company that wants to partner with a nation in the Middle East and you want to expand your market, and Israel is a country that is, as we talked about earlier, expanding its uh, platform in the region, then you've got this democratic nation that that respects the rule of law. That's the place that you're going to want to be. And, and as we look to to uh, to really combat the efforts of, of China and its economic diplomacy, these global partnerships are really critical, and that's what we're trying to help achieve. Thank you so much, Congressman. And, and you brought up China, <laughs> um, which is um, a hot topic uh, these days in Washington, D.C., with this great deal of focus on ensuring the U.S. can outcompete China, and the race for critical foundational technologies and greater independence and strength in this space is very high on the list. And as the U.S. looks, like you mentioned, to invest in emerging technologies and partner with techno democracies to compete with China, do you see any specific opportunities that this may bring for this collaboration with Israeli companies? Um, I, I, it's interesting. I, I do. As I alluded to before, we need to create partnerships with our allies. Israel is obviously a perfect example uh, of a country with a strong relationship with the United States. Um, that it's an example of a country that's also been quartered by China. And as we look forward, we want the we want the U.S. to be the preferred partner. That's that's the way that we're we ought to approach China. We know that that. China doesn't require the, uh, the the kinds of strings attached that the U.S. does. Um, all the more reason why we ought to be working with uh, with our democratic allies, with strong democratic principles um, around emerging technologies and respect for the intellectual property, and making sure that uh, that rule of law is upheld. and And it's natural to do that between. The United States and countries like Israel. It's also important, I think, for us to work with Israel and our European allies as well. Um, I mean, I know, I know that China is always looking for markets, not just for technology, but uh, but for military hardware, military technology at all as well, rather. And I think we need um, we need to work with our allies to to make sure that. Um, that everyone understands what it's like to have innovation and rule of law and protections for intellectual property uh, and uh, and respect for democracy um, all 
those those countries who share that, I think, need to work really closely together. And that's the best way to, uh, to combat a, a rise in China. Congressman Deutsch, I, I can't thank you enough. You've brightened my day, my my week, my year, <laughs> um, which is very positive. I'm so glad. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really, I have no words to express my gratitude, and it's truly on behalf of so many for everything that you do and everything that you stand for. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, thanks, Maytel. I appreciate the opportunity a lot. and. Regards to everybody, uh, everyone here and, and uh, all of your colleagues and our friends in Israel as well. Thank you for listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, brought to you by Holland and Knight's Public Policy and Regulation Group. For more information on our Public Policy and Regulation Group, please visit hklaw.com slash PPR. 